We're going to talk, we're going to give you a recap of, um, of last week real quick. I wasn't happy, too happy with the way I laid it out. I don't know, maybe it made sense to you, but um, <clears throat> I felt like it was kind of... So we'll just go through some things here real quick, and then uh, Lord willing, we'll finish this, uh, this study today. But uh, I told you originally that uh, Brother Mike Constein had written a book called The Law, uh, God and the Christian, and it had to do with how the law came into being. And uh, that's basically what we're looking at. I'm throwing a few things in there, thoughts that I have, and, uh, but it's basically that study. And last week, uh, turn to Galatians 3.19. If you want to follow along, we'll give you, two, give you these verses pretty quick. But he says there in Galatians 3.19, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So we know why the law was added. It was added because of transgressions. There's, a couple, there's another verse that says that sin might become exceeding sinful. But there's another uh, part to that, that angels had something to do with the law being instituted. And look at Romans 5.14. The fact that it took 2,500 years before the Lord instituted the covenant of the law to the children of Israel, the fact that it took 2,500 years says something. Why not sooner? Why not right after Adam and Eve sinned? Why wait 2,500 years around 1500 B.C. Is when He gave them the law? And it says there in Romans 5.14, it says, Nevertheless... Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So you have this break all the way from Adam to Moses, and then there's a curse. It is the covenant of the law. Um, the other thing is the fact that not only 2,500 years before he instituted the covenant of the law, but... He only instituted it on one small group of people. Remember, the, the Gentiles, according to Romans chapter 1, what were they uh, judged by? Conscience. Not the written law. It was the, the oracles of God were committed to the Jew. So, Romans 9.4 says, "...who are Israelites, for whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory..." and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises. Now granted, they had it all, but the law wasn't committed to the Gentiles. Now we're going to see that we end up, we end up under it, but when this law is instituted, according to what the New Testament tells us, it brought about a curse. This thing wasn't really a blessing. Uh, in Galatians 3.10... He says, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Now, it's not that there's something evil about the law. The law is not evil. The Bible says the law is good and right and spiritual and everything. The, the weak link was man. Man couldn't keep it. So... I don't, I'm trying to think. It, it, it's like uh, anyone that has flesh is condemned. Well, we all have flesh. So what, by putting the law on us, it, it was like, I mean, we're already sinners. It was a foregone conclusion. And so man was a weak link because he couldn't keep it. And the Bible tells us in Romans 4.15, Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. I mean, it seemed like if that's the thing to do, just don't institute any law. You know, they say ignorance of the law is no excuse, and that may be true, but when there is no law, there is no transgression. Now, if there's a law in the books and you don't know it, well, that's your own ignorance. Uh, there's so many laws today that I guarantee you that if the government ever wanted to find you guilty of something, they'd find it because they have got so much out there 
and there's no way you can walk in it. I mean, it's corrupted itself. Of course, every politician, they just seem to get away with everything. Murder, I mean, <laughs> I mean, they can do anything these days. But you get out of line they wanna, and they want to uh, uh, put the controls on you, they'll find something. But it says, because the law worketh wrath, where where no law is, there's no transgression. I mean, that's what you want to, there's where you want to be. You want to be under no law. Because if there's no law, there's no transgression. Right? Well, he says there, because uh, ordained by the angels, the angels chose this thing. So the angels chose the law, which brought about a curse on all who were under it. And of course, we know that God put the Israelites under it. They were given the law. But we find out that angels were held to a standard not imposed on man for about 2,500 years before the law came in. And we saw that in Hebrews 2, verses 1 and 2. He says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. When those angels got out of line, there was no second chance. Which kind of, it kind of explains some things. And if you think about it, I've always wondered why God just doesn't you know, show His face in the sky and yell down all the time whenever He wants to contact us. Well, that does away with faith, doesn't it? You know, if, if you make a decision that you're not going to follow God and you're looking at him eyeball to eyeball, I'd say it's over with, wouldn't you? I mean, these angels, man, uh, evidently they've made a decision. And we're going to uh, get into that a little bit more in a minute. So, the reason for the law, and, I, and, I'm, I'm, and this is with a part where it's a little speculation on my part, just to let you know. But it seems to me that the reason for the law may have been envy. And the envy is because they were losing dominion. Before man shows up, it looks like it is an angelic universe. It looks like that. He talks about when he created the foundation of the world over there in Job, that the sons of God uh, and the, the morning stars uh, shouted together for joy or whatever. It sounds like these angels were, they were it. And it's... I think it goes even beyond that. They not only lost the dominion, because look, look with me in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5 to 9. And this, uh, when I read this with the thought of, of, of this study, it jumped out at me uh, immensely that there was something there. Hebrews chapter 2, look at verse 5. And notice we're talking about angels here. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come. He's talking about the millennium. Where we speak, but one in a certain place testifying, saying, what is man that thou art mindful of him? So, he's, somehow he's rejected the angels, and the question comes up, what is man that thou art mindful of him? You know, I ask that question myself. What is man? That thou, why us? Well, at one point, it, uh, I think the option went to the angels, and they blew it. And now it's given to man, but God's gone a step further. He couldn't go, do for them angels. We'll get, we'll get to it. What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Look at this. And thou crownest him with glory and honor. He gave the creation under the hand of man. He said, it's yours now. It's King Adam. He says, Thou just set him over the works of thy hands. And all the angels of God said, Oh. Well, what happened? Remember now, there in the beginning, shouting and praising God, and then something goes very wrong. Next thing you know, he's putting it all under a man, of whom Adam is the federal head. Verse 8, thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. And now he's not referring to Christ there, he's referring to man. I understand it's going to, because Jesus Christ is a man, but he's talking about man. 
Listen, up until the fall, he's given man dominion over everything on the planet. And eventually, listen, if man hadn't sinned, guess what? The entire works of his hands. That thing was going to be moving out to a universe. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. Didn't leave anything for the angels. And, and now we see not yet all things put under him. In other words, hadn't happened yet because of a little issue called sin. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. Now, even that is a slap in the face. Now listen. When you look back there in the Old Testament, you find a theophany, an appearance of God, and you find the angel of the Lord. We know that from Galatians 4.14, I believe it is, something like that, that Jesus Christ is the angel of the Lord. So we have his appearance back there as an angel. You see, I think God wants to relate to the creature that he creates. And when he shows up in that Old Testament, he's the angel of the Lord. In fact, he even shows up in the New Testament still. But there's a certain portion where it goes so far and then the express image of his person is not an angel anymore. It's a man who was made a little lower than the angels. And they kind of they lost it, didn't they? Uh, he says, For we see Jesus made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. He couldn't do that for the angels. As far as I know, angels can't die. I mean, their spirit doesn't say anything about a soul. There's two things an angel doesn't have that we have. A soul and what else? No, they got free will. Huh? Well, that's true too. Okay. Third thing. Blood. They don't have blood. So, so the, world, the world to come begins with the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, the man, Christ Jesus, with Israel and the church ruling and reigning. I try to go back and see where angels are going to be reigning. I can show you where tribulation saints are resurrected and rule and reign with Christ. I can show you where the church rules and reign with Christ. I can show you where the Israelites rule and reign with Christ. I cannot show you where angels rule and reign with Christ. I can't. I don't know of a verse. They not only lose the kingdom... But eventually, they lose God in their image as a theophany, as an appearance. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Who's sitting at the right hand of the majesty on high? The man, Christ Jesus. Not an angel. Not the angel of the Lord. The man. In fact, he still bears the marks of the crucifixion. The passion. It says, being made so much better than the angels, uh-oh, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now look what it says. Look what it says, verse 14. Uh, this, is, this is what the angels are, are, are doing. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? They have no more, longer any role of ruling or reigning, but ministering to those that are going to be heirs. Can you feel the tension in the room? <laughs> huh? That was verse uh, 14. I'm sorry, I jumped from verse 4 to 14. Verse 14 of uh, Hebrews chapter 1. So, before faith came, and by the way, let me see if I'm, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. New heavens and new earth, new Jerusalem. 
The light of New Jerusalem is Jesus Christ, the man. And that is the image, as far as I can tell from Scripture, that is the image that he has for all eternity. You say, now could he appear? I guess he could if he wanted to. He appeared in the book of Acts as the angel of the Lord when he smote Herod. So I do have reference to that. And that was after his ascension. But it looks like after Revelation chapter 21, or, or in eternity, when the new heavens and new earth are, are created, and when the new Jerusalem comes down, Jesus Christ is dwelling in New Jerusalem, and that's it. There's, there's His image as a lamb slain. I mean, that's it. So it looks like eventually the angels even lose that. So they've lost... They've lost something. And it looks like we've got some new enemies. Look at Acts chapter 7. You know what they say about you don't miss it till it's gone? <laughs> Acts chapter 7. It's not, I don't think, you know... Nobody's being mistreated here. Those that are in obedience to God are going to get blessed. You know, and it, like I said, it's better to be a, a, a street sweeper in the house of God than, you know, um, king of hell, you know. I mean, it, 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 you're better off not winding up in, under the wrath of God. But in Acts chapter 7, verse 52 and 53, this is where Stephen's preaching his message. He said, Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. Now that word disposition, it's got a lot of, uh, it's got a lot of, um, um, what I'm trying to say, hmm? connotations, definitions. This is the one I, that I think applies to this. It says, the power or authority to arrange, to settle or manage control. This was a move. It was more political. I think of this and I think of, yeah, this is the Democratic Party. This is the, this is the liberals in our country. And the political move, because they knew exactly what they were doing. When they said, you know, here's, what, here, here's what's happened. These angels, when they made a wrong move, of course, you know, they've got God in their sights. When they made a wrong move, it was bam. I mean, it was, it, the judgment came, you know, there it was. But man, well, he, he's down there living like a scoundrel. And there's no law that, uh, other than the one that was given to Adam, because it says they, they couldn't sin after the similitude of Adam because there was no tree to tree of the knowledge of good and evil to go pull one, they pulled some fruit off of. So they were guilty of other things by conscience. I, I understand that. But the law itself wasn't over them to curse them before they ever even got out of bed. Okay? So these angels were upset that God was so exacting with them, but he wasn't with this, uh, this mankind down here. And they chose it, and, it and, and they disposed it. They, they put it into place to control something. Now think about this. We know, we know that the law brings a curse. In fact, it put God in, in, a, in, a, in a bad situation. I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. I'm going to stop just a second. Look at Ephesians 6.12. I want to talk about these angels just for a second. Then I'll talk about the quandary that the Lord got himself into. Um. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. He's not just talking about the devil. We have more enemies than that. Because what these angels have done is created this situation on us, demanding that God be equal to us, and literally forcing his hand. And again, 
You can go ahead and force God's hand all you want. You can go ahead and do something God doesn't want you to do. People thwart the will of God all the time, but you're not going to outsmart Him. And these angels didn't outsmart Him. They may, have, they may have gotten Him to do something that He did not want to do. He doesn't want to send people to hell, does He? But He, do, he will, won't He? He didn't want to do this, but He did it because the angels pushed Him to do it. So all He does is, He says, okay, that's your move on the chessboard, now watch my moves. I mean, he worked it out, and that's what we're going to see at the end here, but he's being pressured to do it. Why? Because we have enemies that want to see us fail and want to see us cursed. So he put us under the law. And that spiritual wickedness in high places, that what makes me think of those angels. Let me, uh, Psalms 7849, Psalm 7849, little verse tucked away there in the, about the middle of the Psalms. It says, He cast upon them the fierceness of His anger, wrath and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. Gives you a new uh, outlook on those little figurines. Okay, If you want to get rid of yours, I'll take them out to my range and shoot them. Um, there's some evil angels. In fact, there's a whole bunch of them. In fact, about a third of the host. See, I don't think, I don't think during the tribulation, a third of the host all of a sudden decides they're going to fall. Now, they may decide to leave the, uh, the, their first estate, but the decision's already been made. It's already happened. We have a third of the angelic host that are against us. Amen. Then who can be against us? Amen. In Job forty-one eight or Job four eighteen, excuse me, he says, "Behold, he put no trust in his servants, and his angels he charged with folly." Not angel, angels, plural. He charged them with folly, foolishness. Ends up in, being fornication and everything else. Um, so let me read you a couple of verses here about what, what's been going on with these angels. And, and in Jude 1, Jude 1, there's only one chapter, but verse 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains of their darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So, some of them that have already fallen have already wound up in chains of darkness in the pit, waiting for judgment. Others are yet to leave their first estate and come down here, but they're coming. I mean, this is, I mean when we talk about it, when the, when the Bible talks about a spiritual warfare, it really, it, it's not kidding. I told you last week that, um, and I don't know if it's true or not, I don't know if I can think of any Bible, but it, it makes sense, that the third of the angelic host that, that, that will depart and end up being defecting, the church makes up for that number. Remember, it says there are, there's an innumerable company of angels. And the resurrection we bo body we get is what? Equal to the angels. That's what it says. So God's making up the difference. Maybe he had so many, he, he I don't know, he, he's got the number, I'm sure, but so many that he created, a third of them are, are going to leave. He said, okay, I'll replace them. Maybe that's what the number we're waiting on. So get to work, okay? Win all you can. The sooner we get that number, the quicker we get out of here. I don't know if there's any truth to that. I'm just... But 2 Peter 2, 4 says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. I mean, these, there, there are angels, plural. Then in Revelation 12, 4, And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which is ready to be delivered to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now verse 9 defines what those stars are. It says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. How many? A third of the host. You see where are they coming? They're coming down here. What do you think they're going to do when they get here? I can tell you exactly what they're going to do. They're going to enslave man. 
think about, I mean, you just think about the devil with, with, with a third of the host down here running things. they pretty much tie up all the loose ends, wouldn't they? Yeah, Genesis 6, they've been here before. They're just coming again. This, I mean, the next time they show up in mass number, it's going to be a bunch of them. Now, I don't know, there may be one or two of them. Maybe the Antichrist shows up first, you know, and says, well, I've got some pals behind me here. You know, <laughs> they're going to follow me. You know, I got some. I got a few other folks, friends that want to show up. You know, next thing you know, you got millions of these things landed here. I know you know, may, may not believe that, but that's what the Bible teaches. They're coming down here. Um, maybe that's the reason why they keep you know all this thing about these aliens and stuff is is nothing more than probes and and uh, figuring out things and and how they're going to do things when they get here. That's what I think it is. Yes, sir. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And you know, there. I know there's a bunch of them that have them come as being um, enemies, but they also have have them coming in peace and helping us, you know, and ET, you know, that type of thing. Uh, they're 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 getting they're getting the world ready. And listen. The world's been expecting it. I've been expecting it. Of course, I'm... And you say, well, if it happens... I saw something on, uh, on TV about these aliens and, and, and UFOs and all this stuff, you know, and they said, well, the reason why the government kept it, uh, uh, kept it quiet is because it would destroy religion. Well, maybe religion, but it won't destroy my Bible. My Bible says they're coming. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me a bit. If, listen, if the news came on tomorrow morning and said, we have gotten, we've made contact, and they're coming. It wouldn't surprise me. I'd be excited, though. But it would not surprise me. They are coming. <clears throat> now, whether we're, we're going to be here when they get here, probably we won't be. Because we know, well, at least Bible believers should, know who they are. And all this thing going on around here, you know, and, and new world, our worlds out there, and, and uh, evolution, and blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> it's just nonsense. Somebody's upset because they lost dominion and they lost control. So they try instituting, they, they force God, or let's put it this way, they put God on the spot that he put the law on at least a certain few people. But then we find out he did some things to, to help that out. Um, so when they, when they instituted the law, they put, they put God in a real quandary. The law did not cancel God's promise. We've already read that. But it stood squarely in the way of implementing it. And this is what I want to get to. In Galatians 3.17, it says, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before, before God in Christ, the, uh, the law, before the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. That's Galatians 3.17. In other words, the law couldn't destroy the promise that God had already made to Abraham, but it sure could do one thing, that it could never be implemented as long as the law was in place. We could never meet the standard of the law for Him to bring in that kingdom eternally. Because why? The law was a curse to us. As long as that thing was in the way. Do you see what the, the, the political thing? He moved it into place and He... He, he, he put us at a stalemate. Stalemate. I mean, there's no way God could bring in that kingdom as long as that law was in place and as long as we were guilty of it. So, the Lord had a temporary fix. Animal sacrifice. Something innocent got sacrificed in their place. But the Bible says, for it is not possible, Hebrews 10, 4, that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. It wasn't the fix. It was just something to hold back the, the wrath or the judgment that should have followed when they violated. Listen, he put them under 613 laws from Genesis to Deuteronomy. And it's everything from moral laws, which are good, but it was also ceremonial stuff. And it was exact. They couldn't deviate a bit. A 
Uzzah, concerned, reaches up his hand to steady the ark. God drops him dead. The letter of the law killeth. And God had to, he had to get that thing out of the way. So it says there, in, turn to Galatians chapter 4. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 to 7. It says, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman. I mean, you know, that's a, a man with a womb, man, made of a woman, made under the law. To redeem them that were what? Under the law. That we might receive the adoption of sons. Listen, you know why you can't redeem an angel? He doesn't have any blood. That's why I came. We're redeemed by what? The blood of the Lamb. Not with gold and silver and, and precious stones, but by the precious blood of Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. He says, And because ye are sons, God has set forth the Spirit of, uh, of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir. <laughs> there it is, man. He's bringing it right back around. He said, I'm, I'm going to make heirs out of them. I'm going to put them back in the line, but I, first I've got to do something. I've got to take care of that law. So what does God do? He comes down here as a man, and He keeps that perfect law. I mean, every jot and tittle, He keeps it. And then look what it says here. Oh, first, He had to do something else. In Galatians 3.22, it says, But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So you know what you know what God did? He says, you know what? Let's just take that law and apply it to everybody, condemn them all. The Bible says that if he that hath the Son is not condemned, but he that hath uh, he that hath not the Son is condemned already. It's not a question of whether you might or might not be condemned. You are already condemned. Concluded all under sin. Look in Colossians chapter 2. Here's where it happened. There's probably a few gaps in, my, in this thing, but I can't fill them in. But this is what I do understand. In Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 14, it says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. He had to get it out of the way. And the only way for him to get it out of the way, number one, is he had to, he had to live a perfect life, or a sinless life, and then he had to pay for every, every time we broke that law. Blotting out the hand. See, we, just, we not only needed our sins paid for, but we needed righteousness. It, that's why he had to be the standard of righteousness as a man. There's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Just as Moses was the mediator of the covenant of the law that the angels chose, Jesus Christ is the mediator when it comes to this thing called grace. The grace of God. Um, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Hold on, look at this. And having spoiled principalities and powers. Remember, <laughs> spiritual wickedness in high places? Is that what it said in Ephesians 6? It says he spoiled them right there. Oh, it goes on. And he made a show of them openly. Yeah, that's always say he's uh, <laughs> sticking out his tongue. Triumphing over them in it. See, they thought they had him. They thought they'd outsmarted. They thought they'd put man in a position where he could never have that kingdom, never take that dominion that they once had. They thought they won. It says in verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you. <laughs> in meat or in drink or respect of a holy day or of the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. Those will be in the millennium. But the body is of Christ. Let no man... Oh, look at this in verse 18. Throw right in there. 
Where did this come from? Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. Why throw that in there? Well, he made a show of them. They said, now, hey, don't you be guilty of ever bowing to an angel. They don't have dominion over you. And don't be worshiping them either. Uh, this whole world is... You would think that God sits up there and does nothing. The angels do everything. You'll find out they don't do much, but they might be doing stuff to hurt you. You know, the Bible says in the tribulation they entertain angels unawares. Doesn't mean they're always good ones. Could be evil ones too. <laughs> Never thought about that. We always think of angels as always being good. Well, there's evil angels. There's fallen angels. There's a whole bunch of them that would love to see you cursed. In fact, they put the curse on you. And then God got it off of you. It says, intruding into those things which ye have not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So, don't give angels any, don't give angels any more credit than, than what God gives them. They're ministering spirits. And who are they to minister to? Us! Us! And the ones that won't, well, now you know who those, those are that are going to fall. Going to leave their first estate. I think I covered it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. That's a thought. That's a thought. She's saying that... Um, Maybe it wasn't just Satan that thought that Jesus Christ would call down 12 legions of angels who would have destroyed everything breathing on this earth, but thought he might do that, or expected him to do that, and he didn't do it. So maybe uh, those 12 legions, maybe it is those, that third of the angelic host that stepped forward and said, we'll do it, we'll kill them all. Who knows, man? We're going to find out some stuff. I thought I did. What? Uh, go ahead. Okay, Hebrews two two. Yeah, yeah, I read that. Yep, that's one of the first things I read. About the for the word by angels was steadfast. Every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. Yep. Okay. You say, well, I got some unanswered questions. So do I, but I don't. <laughs> There's just something to that. The fact that every, when he gets into that thing about taking away the handwriting of ordinances, then he talks about not worshiping angels and make a showing of them openly and triumphing over them in it. And like, they got something to do with this thing. You know, maybe, maybe I mean, the law, when you think about it, I thought to myself, why did God institute the law when he knew it would condemn us all? Yes. He can forgive. God can forgive transgressions. Now, he may not be able to clear the guilty in the sense that he can just take it away, but he can forgive it. But under the law, man, that, that, that I mean it was it was a, Listen, the one he made the the one he made the promise to was the one he ended up having to curse. The seed of Abraham. That's who he made the promise to, and that's who he ended up handing the curse to. So, it's, it's almost like, I've always thought this, and I believe it's so, God just loves for the deck to be stacked against him. He, did, he just, I mean, you know, 300 against uh, 135,000 Midianites. They killed 120,000 of them. 135,000 Midianites, 300. I mean, that's stacking the deck, man. And God loves that deck stacked against him because you aren't going to outsmart him. He created the board. Listen, he created the game. You're not going to outsmart him. He'll use every move you make, he'll use it against you. And that's what you'd think. I don't know how they, they couldn't know that. I don't know. It just doesn't make sense to me. I mean, you can't outsmart God. So, but they tried. Or maybe they tried to put him in a position. I don't know what they are trying to accomplish from it, but. time of his crucifixion, I really believe that Satan thought he was going to wipe out mankind. 
I really believe it. And then when he didn't, Judas tries to reverse the thing. Why go to all the trouble to... I mean, you had to know that when you, that they, they wanted him dead. You had to know that you were betraying him. Why would you go and do all that and then all of a sudden try to reverse the thing in, in mid-course? Because he didn't do what he, what, what he thought he would do. In the uh-oh moment, that sinking feeling. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. Somebody else got a comment? Because we're out of time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 